Good afternoon, everyone. This is Christine Friedner speaking. I'm here to moderate our second digital forum of the COVID-19 anatomy of a pandemic, the current status of the COVID-19 emergency. Uh, this series was uh, conceptualized by the O'Brien Institute for Public Health, and it will be a forum for us to showcase some of the work of our O'Brien Institute members and the wider University of Calgary community. And we would like to, um, uh, first of all, start off by a territorial acknowledgement. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the territorial, um, traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta. Uh, the city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. The, the work that uh, we are presenting to you today uh, comes out of some of the uh, task force members of the COVID-19 University of Calgary Advisory Group. And I would like to just acknowledge the members of that group that's led by Dr. William Galley. Today, we are very fortunate to have Dr. John Conley as one of our speakers. And the task force members are listed here. And I would also like to acknowledge that we have two new task force members, Dr. Katrina Nalini and Dr. Ronald Neagle. So to begin with, Dr. John Conley, he's currently the medical director of the Ward of the 21st Century at the O'Brien Institute for Public Health. And he's also the co-director for the Snyder Institute for Chronic Diseases at the University of Calgary. He's the chair of the World Health Organization's Infection Prevention and Control Research and Innovation Advisory Group. And he's a senior member of the O'Brien Institute, a professor of medicine in infectious diseases at the Cummings School of Medicine. And he's also the medical director for IPC with Albert Health Services. In 2018, he was appointed to the Order of Canada for his pioneering contributions in infection prevention and control, antimicrobial resistance, and healthcare innovations. Dr. Conley is joined today by Dr. Michelle Schindler. She's a graduating public health and preventive medicine resident physician at the University of Calgary. She's, she's been working on the provincial AHS COVID-19 response since January, and most recently as the architect of the expansion of public health contact tracing teams to over 400 individuals, including medical students. She's been featured in local and national media for her role in contact tracing in Alberta, including CBC's The National and The Globe and Mail, and her work has been adopted across uh, Canada. So today we, are, uh, we have uh, this presentation on Zoom, but we also have it on Facebook Live. So for those of you joining us uh, through Zoom, you can use the question and answer box. For those of you joining by Facebook Live, please use the comment box. And we're also uh, tweeting about this particular uh, presentation, and you can send any comments in through uh, Twitter as well. So now um, I will hand it over to Dr. Conley. Thank you very much. Um, and I just want to do a sound check. You're able to hear me all right? So I'll just begin with my um, disclosure and acknowledgements. Uh, the relevant disclosures uh, are listed there. Uh, the only one of note with uh, the pharmaceutical industry is a Strive Staph aureus vaccine trial. Um, Dr. Conley, sorry, this is Brittany, one of the, the hosts. Can you just um, make your slides full screen? Uh, thought it was full screen. Is that better? Um, there should be a little icon. Um, oh, so yes, so if you go down, there's that little icon, uh, one, two more over from that. Um, at the very bottom, uh, yeah. There we go. There we go, thank you. Sorry about that. So the only one uh, is of any note is the um, Staph aureus uh, spinal surgery um, study uh, funded by Pfizer, but all of the money went to the University of uh, Calgary. And I would like to uh, also acknowledge Christine for the uh, introduction and uh, Dr. John Gill uh, permission to use some of his slides. Um, and uh, also the um, IPC professionals and physicians within Alberta Health Services uh, who have been instrumental in some of the uh, work that's done with respect to uh, the use of um, personal protective equipment, which I will touch on in my presentation. So the first thing I wanted to just mention is to disentangle the message. This is certainly um, unprecedented times. We've seen 
the message coming through mainstream media and social media. This is probably um, the first pandemic in history that has been an overdrive, if not total overdrive, as a result of uh, social media. When you talk about uh, Twitter, use of Facebook, the messaging, the information is, is being fed out uh, so rapidly. But it's also important to recognize that uh, you have to uh, use your critical appraisal skills, not only for the papers that are published online, even before reviewed, the Twitter feeds about those papers, people are reading abstracts and then firing them off. Oh, look, it's, it's uh, now floating in the air. Uh, there are other uh, items that are occurring. Uh, hydroxychloroquine can be used. Uh, and then we see it uh, being um, pasted into uh, Twitter uh, accounts uh, without all the accompanying information. So it's important not to jump to premature, premature conclusions uh, or to look at uh, data that never gets published or uh, what we call fake news. So even in the high quality journals, articles are being published. Uh, editors are wanting things out very quickly. Um, the peer review process may not be what it would normally be. So it's very care, uh, important to carefully, critically appraise you, the information that's coming out. And uh, it's important to keep it in context in that regard. So please use your critical appraisal skills. Some basic viral facts. We know that this is caused by the SARS coronavirus 2, causing the COVID-19 uh, infection. Um, we know that it's a single-stranded RNA virus. It's uh, similar to many other types of uh, coronaviruses, and they are very plentiful. We think about a One Health concept. There are many types of porcine and um, feline, uh, canine coronaviruses. There are a number that uh, affect um, uh, the, the uh, chickens, and, and um, we also know that they are very plentiful in the bat population. Uh, we do know that in all likelihood, uh, this uh, particular virus had its origins in the Asian bat family, and I'll touch on that uh, later. The viruses that we know about that are most closely related are the SARS coronavirus 1, responsible for the 2002-2003 uh, outbreak of uh, SARS in uh, Hong Kong and in uh, Canada, Vietnam, and other parts of uh, Southeast Asia. And then the MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory uh, um, Syndrome virus. We do know also that this particular uh, virus, which uh, migrated from the uh, Asian bat population uh, and originated in uh, the uh, open markets in Wuhan, China, uses an ACE2 receptor. So this is very similar to the angiotensin uh, converting enzyme that we have in humans. Uh, and that compared to the SARS coronavirus 1, uh, there's quite a high affinity for this particular uh, receptor. Uh, in the respiratory epithelial cells. Uh, some people have speculated that uh, because of this very high affinity, much higher than for SARS coronavirus 1, could there be a lower inoculum uh, to be able to establish invasive infection uh, following uh, contact? So uh, that's an important thing to keep in mind. Those studies are ongoing. As I mentioned, it likely originated from Asian bats. We do know that the MERS coronavirus came from Middle Eastern uh, bats, and then the intermediary were camels. Uh, in this case, there's some suggestion that perhaps it's the Asian anteater, the pangolin. Uh, that has not been proven, but we know that pangolins can carry uh, this particular um, SARS coronavirus too. Uh, the question is, was it the chicken or the egg? Which came first? Uh, that work is ongoing. We do know that from uh, phylogenetic studies that there is quite a um, marked similarity between the genome sequences of SARS coronavirus 1 and SARS coronavirus 2, uh, and that it's a little more distantly related to the MERS uh, virus. We also know that um, IgEG and IgM antibodies are produced, and I'll touch on that a little later, and uh, this may be a signal for uh, immunity. Uh, those tests will be commercially available very shortly and they will help us a great deal in looking at natural history studies and also on uh, healthcare staffing and also in the public health modeling. One important point within the construct of this pandemic, no one in the world is immune to this. There is no natural immunity. And this is where a major issue is occurring in terms of its uh, transmission and the effects that it has on the human population. 
to diagnose COVID-19, uh, nasopharyngeal swab is the mainstay uh, based on good respiratory samples. And uh, it is a um, two-step process looking at the E gene and also the polymerase gene. The spike gene that you saw in the opening slide is the one that's important for it to be able to enter into its intracellular location in respiratory epithelial lining cells. But the E gene and the polymerase gene are, are uh, the one-two punch that are used for the identification of the um, finding of a SARS coronavirus 2. We do know that uh, these tests are, uh, are very high sensitivity uh, in the range of 90 to 95%. And we also know that a throat swab is uh, almost identical. Uh, anterior nasal swabs do not have the same sensitivity. Uh, you have to go to at least the middle terminants or beyond. And when you take the nasopharyngeal or the throat specimens, it is important to scrape cells off. And that's why you turn and twist the specimens to be able to get those cells because this virus lives in an intracellular location. So you must do that if you do touch swabs and we had a number of falsely negative anterior nary swabs, you will get negative tests. So it's important to do that. It's also important that it does, uh, the testing is done at a time when you would most likely find positive um, specimens. If you do it too early and someone is just incubating, you can get a falsely negative test. There's also concerns about the reagents that are required because the entire world is now testing. Uh, there are also flock swabs. They were made predominantly in Italy, which has been severely affected by COVID. So there are shortages of the nasopharyngeal flock swabs. Currently now in AHS, they're doing throat swabs until they can um, re-engineer their supply. There is ongoing work uh, being done with a 3D printed flock swabs. Uh, hopefully we'll see something about that in the near future. Um, and as I mentioned, serology is uh, coming very quickly um, into our uh, domain, which will help us a great deal in looking at population-based serosurveys. In the natural history of this infection, um, the proportion of asymptomatic or posi-symptomatic infections is unknown. It's very critical to uh, looking for our understanding of transmission and also in immunity. Uh, there are many models uh, that suggest it could be up to 40 to 50 percent, but that's based on modeling, so it depends very highly on the assumptions that are placed into it. Most individual level studies are suggesting that it's anywhere from zero to six percent, so we continue to believe it is low, but there are many ongoing studies with respect to uh, asymptomatic transmission. There's been a couple of recent papers and some which I've been uh, able to see uh, uh, studies that have been presented to the WHO that suggest that it's going to be relatively low, uh, but it's very important to, again, critically appraise these studies and to ensure that uh, an asymptomatic is truly an asymptomatic, uh, which is very important as well. Uh, the vast majority of individuals, almost 98%, will develop symptoms within 11 days, uh, and the incubation period is about a median of five days, but anywhere from two to 14 days. And of those diagnosed, 80% will have mainly mild illness of about 10 to 14 days duration. 15% will have more severe illness, uh, moderate to severe requiring medical care, uh, plus or minus hospitalization and oxygen therapy, which is the mainstay. <clears throat> about 5% go on to become ventilated, but ventilation uh, is a signal for a poor outcome because uh, you can have complications with renal failure, multi-organ failure, and the death rate is about 65 to 70 percent of ventilated patients um, are, do not make it out of the intensive care unit and off the ventilator. So that's always a major concern if someone heads to the intensive care unit for ventilation. The uh, illness itself uh, looks very much like influenza, so hence an influenza-like illness. Uh, you can see fever, cough, myalgias, uh, interesting symptoms of anosmia, hypoosmia, and dysquesia have been um, noted in a number of the cases, but with any respiratory viral infection, be it rhinovirus or um, Coxsackie or adenovirus or human coronavirus that caused the uh, common cold, we do, some, uh, do see some relative degree of uh, lack of smell and lack of or altered taste. So that may not be completely discriminatory, but an interesting phenomenon noted in many papers now is the onset very early on of anosmia 
and uh, uh, altered taste dysplasia uh, very early on before the onset of the other symptoms with the fever, muscle aches, uh, sore throat. We also see a sudden onset of headache um, out of character for an individual and also diarrhea in uh, about three to five percent and uh, in some uh, uh, productive uh, cough with hemoptysis. Presenting symptoms, you can see here, uh, fever uh, noted in a very high percentage. Uh, and interestingly, 20% can have fever between approximately um, 37.4 to 38 degrees. And uh, that's noted in the next slide. But you can see here, fever, cough, dyspnea, malaise. The big signal symptom is dyspnea, which would indicate that you're not doing well and it's time for some uh, medical assessment. Um, uh, lab tests, uh, um, the white count can be down. Uh, we can see lymphopenia. Uh, we also can see thrombocytopenia. And uh, we also can see elevated liver function tests and see reactive protein. Uh, radiology studies do indicate um, that you can see so-called ground glass opacities and infiltrates and the crazy paving interstitial changes at the base of the lungs. This is the intense inflammatory response that occurs with the viral pneumonitis caused by this virus. Some of the uh, complications, and these are in the more moderately to severely ill individuals. Unfortunately, once you head to intensive care and we see ventilation required, you can get acute respiratory distress syndrome, acute kidney injury and renal failure, uh, liver dysfunction, cardiac injury, secondary bacterial pneumonias, and then gastrointestinal bleeding uh, and bacteremia. So a series of um, in the intensive care unit complications, which also lead to the higher mortality. And if we look at the case fatality rate, you can see that uh, it's variable. Uh, some reports say that it can be uh, below 1% uh, in the range of 0.5 to 1%, others as high as 10%. Uh, that's variable based on the population. We do know that uh, you can see an age-dependent, decade-dependent increase in mortality depicted on the slide here. This is from the Chinese Center for Disease Control. And um, you can see also that in a setting such as Lombardy, where they had a very elderly population, the case fatality rate in elderly people, if you have a population that are in the range of 70 to 80 or 80 plus, you are going to see high mortality because that's your predominant population. So very much population dependent uh, and certainly much lower mortality in the lower age groups. The overall case fatality rate is between two to uh, one to two percent. That's global population but again dependent upon the particular population in your jurisdiction it can be higher or lower uh, depending on uh, that demographic. The uh, treatments that are used at this point is predominantly a supportive care uh, there are uh, reports of um, an anti-HIV drug, uh, which is Coletra, Lopinavir, Ritonavir. Somewhat disappointing, uh, recent New England Journal publication suggesting not a clear uh, benefit. Hydroxychloroquine, you've heard about uh, azithromycin and chloroquine. Their value is unclear, but there are ongoing studies, uh, over 500 on clinicaltrials.gov, and we have the launch of HOPE uh, and CATCO, uh, which is uh, uh, AHS and uh, CHR funded respectively and uh, we're also seeing some trials that are being launched with respect to uh, tozolizumab which is an anti uh, IL-6 binder and then of course uh, passive immunotherapy uh, with a study that's being launched uh, through, throughout Canada and other jurisdictions to use um, the sera of patients uh, who have recovered to give them um, uh, infusions of um, antibody-rich um, serum to be able to help them uh, give uh, passive immunotherapy to overcome the infection. And then uh, an, a drug named remdesivir, which does appear to hold some promise, but it's difficult to get. Uh, some patients in Alberta were treated early on, then it was pulled back, and now uh, looks like it's going to be made available again in trial format. Some topics generating noise, issues around sex, blood type, NSAIDs, pregnancy, um, and 
the presence of respirable submicron particles via breathing and singing. We've seen many media reports, but again, each of these have to be looked at in turn uh, with carefully done epidemiologic studies to see whether there is a risk factor. We had the health minister in France early on saying NSAIDs were not indicated because of concerns that's since been uh, uh, repudiated, uh, scientific literature coming out suggesting maybe that is not the case. Uh, certainly in pregnancy, we have seen enough data now that um, this age group, uh, it's not like H1N1 where they were a demographic that had more severe disease. We're not seeing that with COVID. So again, uh, I call these uh, issues that generate noise. We need to very carefully look at the scientific literature and critically appraise it. And uh, just to remind you, I'm gonna just touch on uh, some issues around uh, PPE and then turn it over to my uh, co-presenter. So just to remind you, this is where COVID-19 comes from. It's coronavirus disease. And the main transmission routes are through infected individual, through a large droplet and uh, through direct and indirect contact. There are ongoing um, concerns about small submicron so uh, respirable particles, it is unknown yet whether in fact uh, these small, uh, less than one micron um, droplets that are on droplet nuclei that have evaporated um, can be carried over long distance, similar to tuberculosis or measles to be able to provide significant amounts of transmission for disease, but that is still out there. The predominant means of transmission are via large droplets from sneezing, coughing, that's that one meter distance, and hence the physical distancing rule, uh, and then direct contact, and I'll touch on that in a moment, and I believe that uh, contact through fomites and uh, direct contact is an underestimated means of transmission of this virus. We look here at the basal re reproductive number. Most experts suggest it falls between two to three, uh, and a recent Harvard group did a very elegant study that was published to show in Lombardy, despite the very high transmissibility, it's still sitting in that same range of um, two to 2.3. I think they found 2.3. And if you look over on this graph, um, seasonal influenza, the common cold virus, swine flu, they're all in that same range, not compared to chickenpox or measles, which are um, highly transmissible airborne illnesses. Uh, and this study here, just to show you that there was a publication in New England Journal in correspondence, and it created a social media stir. Uh, many people uh, sent this out on Twitter. Uh, they used a three-jet nebulizer and a drum, dropped a bomb of a uh, high-density virus, uh, created a dispersal mechanism, uh, and said, well, this uh, looks to be uh, interpreted as the possibility. The authors are very careful. But of course, social media picked this up and suggested uh, that it's airborne. If you look at the history of the Collinson uh, three jet nebulizer, it's used uh, most commonly in Fort Detrick in the US. It's part of their biologic warfare system. And I've said this in the past you could probably drop wet cement into this and get an aerosol generation because it's a very powerful type of uh, machinery that's meant to generate uh, aerosols. And this study that was published in Nature Medicine on the uh, 1st of April is probably one of the best studies that I've seen. And I'll just draw your attention to a couple of points on slide D in the upper right-hand corner. And it does show you that uh, a positive culture, this is one of the few studies that have done uh, viable culture counts. And they showed that in the throat, saliva, they were able to see uh, viable cultures from day two up to about day eight and thereafter as the IgG rose, uh, they uh, were not able to find uh, positive cultures. And uh, they also showed that yet there, if you look on B, there were still uh, high copy numbers of uh, vi virus detected by PCR. And of course, they were almost certainly cycling up dead virus. So it's very important to note viable virus does not always correlate with positive PCR tests. So that's a very important point to be able to look at. And that brings us to the PPE before I turn over. You can see here that uh, there are people in um, Tyvek suits and hazmat suits. That's not what's required. So I just wanted to show this. And uh, you can see that AHS has done a great job in looking at 
the recommendations um, and they have a, a lot of information on their website which is all hyperlinked it's also available in paper it's also available on the mobile spectrum app COVID-19 so anything that's uh, approved by the emergency command center is available you can just uh, download it from uh, the spectrum website google spectrum COVID um, and uh, you can download that and then choose um, uh, Calgary and Area AHS, and you will find uh, all of this in uh, I, iOS and um, uh, Android format. So you can have a personal digital assistant. The personal protective uh, equipment we recommend are gloves, gloves gowns, uh, facial protection, and uh, that is all laid out very nicely, uh, and it's in the best practice documents. Uh, one of the important things is uh, with respect to uh, the doffing. So um, when you're doffing, uh, it's required that you uh, carefully remove the gloves, then do a 20 to 30 second hand hygiene, followed by careful removal of the uh, gowns, and then another 20 to 30 second hand hygiene with alcohol-based hand gel disinfectant or uh, hand hygiene at a sink with soap and water, followed again by careful removal of the masks uh, and or safety glasses, and again, another hand hygiene. This was very foreign to many physicians, uh, and it's important that these steps are followed to prevent any self-inoculation. With respect to uh, uh, aerosol-generating medical procedures, such as intubation, resuscitation, N95 respirators and eye protection are required, and uh, that's an important uh, distinction from just regular care of these patients. But it's all very nicely laid out uh, in many different formats, uh, web-based, paper-based, and uh, um, uh, personal digital assistant-based material. And finally, in closing, the one thing about envelope viruses is that uh, they can persist on surfaces. You can see here aluminum, metal, wood, paper, glass, plastic, I'll bring your attention to. Many of the SARS and MERS coronavirus family can live for six to nine days on plastic, particularly if they have high amounts of protonation material. The good news is, on the next slide, that uh, any amount of ethanol from 40% onwards, uh, benzoconium chloride, which is in uh, Lysol and many, many hospital products and home-based disinfectant products, and of course bleach, totally inactivates the virus within a minute. Envelope viruses are notoriously susceptible, uh, but it's important to be able to ensure that uh, they are disinfected and that high touch surfaces are disinfected. And with that, I think I'll close over and uh, give the podium over to uh, uh, Rochelle for her uh, presentation. Thank you. Awesome, thanks Dr. Conley. Just share my screen here. There we go. So yeah, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about kind of where we've come from and, and where we currently are with the spread. Um, and so a lot of the questions that we end up getting um, is around the data and understanding how to compare between different countries um, or different provinces even. And so I just kind of want to start with this example that's a little bit more concrete of why there's such discrepancies in the data sometimes. Um, so if you think about those super icy days that we have in Calgary, um, a whole ton of people end up slipping and falling. And so if we look at the data around who actually slips and falls on those icy days, um, it's very easy for us as a health system to identify all the people who have wrist surgery. Um, it's fairly easy to figure out who gets a cast, who gets an x-ray. Um, we can usually end up pulling uh, the number of people who go to the emergency room or urgent care with those symptoms. The problem then becomes identifying the people who go to a family doctor who may or may not, um, you know, write a note that that allows us to identify them as having you know slipped and falled and then there's all these people that end up not actually even presenting for care um, and those are the people who just have a sore wrist they stay at home and that's kind of it um, and so this is kind of if you look at this entire triangle as the people who slip and fall and hurt their wrist on an icy day um, we can only through our data capture a certain percentage of those and that depends on how we actually pull that data 
So as that relates to COVID-19, um, if you think about all the different steps on this journey for folks who, um, you know, start by being exposed to COVID-19, um, how many of those actually become infected, how many of the infected develop symptoms, how many of the symptomatic get tested, how many of the tested, you know, become hospitalized, and then how many of those people develop life-threatening symptoms. Um, most places are really excellent at identifying those people with life-threatening system symptoms. Um, hospitalization is another thing where we have great data quality. Um, it's then the question of like testing is going to greatly depend on where you are in the country, where you are in the world, about whether or not you can get tested, um, and whether or not based on that we can identify if they had symptoms or who they're exposed to. So in Alberta, we're in a really great position for identifying most of this spectrum. Um, so I feel like our data is really high quality and very reliable, but just to kind of caution you comparing to other places, um, if they don't have this full spectrum included, that it's not the full picture of what's actually happening. Um, and I just wanted to let everyone know that m everything you're going to be seeing from me um, is in a log scale. Um, and so if you look on the right side here, you can see like the total number of cases across the world. And it's just kind of like this line going up. Um, it's not super helpful for understanding. That's a linear scale. Um, what happens is that the lower numbers get, end up getting compressed. So if we show things in a log scale, that allows us to see the rate of infection changing. And this is really what we mean by flattening the curve. Um, and so if you look at the exact same data presented on a log scale below that, that is the global uh, change in uh, cases or the number of cases identified over time. And you can see sort of that first wave um, is really the the cases localized to China and surrounding areas, and then that second wave is as it's spread around the world. So if we compare where we're at in Canada, uh, and this is using a really excellent tool developed by uh, Dr. Tyler Williamson and his group, um, link in the bottom there, um, you can see sort of the United States and Spain, um, again, log scale, this is the number of days since 100 cases, so we're sort of comparing apples to apples from the, uh, the spread. United States and Spain are both really had a lot of challenges with controlling COVID. And so I, I would kind of consider them the worst case scenario where we're nowhere near that in Canada. Um, United Kingdom, um, again, the numbers are a bit lower here because of their testing rates are quite low there. Um, but you can see still based on what they've been testing, they've been flattening that curve really well. Um, and then in Canada, we're actually doing even better than that. Here in Alberta, um, as of yesterday, we had 2,800 uh, 2, cases, the vast majority of which are in Calgary zone. Um, our hospital and ICU rates are quite low here, um, and we've sadly had 55 deaths so far from this virus. If you compare how we're doing um, by the different provinces, I've removed sort of the smaller provinces um, just for clarity here. Um, you can see that Qu Quebec had sort of an early spike and they're starting to flatten off now. Um, Ontario has kind of been on that same curve around doubling every five days. Uh, and then lower here we have Alberta and BC where we're actually doing a really good job of flattening the curve even compared to other locations. So in terms of why are we so aggressively going after COVID-19 compared to other pandemics. Um, it's really important to think that, you know, we're four months in uh, to the earliest cases that we know of about this pandemic. Um, and we currently have over 2 million confirmed infected. That's confirmed. That doesn't include all the people who have been tested or have not been tested. So part of the reason why this is different than the flu is because of all the people that are infected, we have a much higher death rate. Um, People can compare this to the Spanish flu, where about a third of the population in the world was infected. Um, but it's a harder comparison because uh, medical science has, has dramatically changed since then. Um, if we look at actually the containment of uh, swine flu in 2009, um, the H1N1, um, we had very high levels of infection across the world. Um, you know, the lower percentage of estimates is around 11% of the global population being infected. And if we applied that same rate and we just said, okay, that number of people are infected um, with COVID-19, that would mean that 28 million people will die. For reference, uh, you can see here estimated swine flu was somewhere between 250 and 300,000 people ended up dying. It's also much more contagious um, than the swine flu, um, as well as seasonal influenza. 
And like Dr. Conley mentioned, there's no partial protection from a previous infection. Um, we don't have a vaccine at this time, and treatment is still very much a big question mark. That means this is where public health comes in. The only reliable way that we have to save lives is to prevent infection. So I don't feel like I really need to sell this. I think we all kind of agree that, you know, prevention is better than treatment. Um, but I think this really succinctly summarizes why this is so critical, um, especially right now when there's some talk about, you know, should we just let everybody get sick? Um, I think the real argument here that Jeffrey Rose proposes is it's better to be healthy than sick or dead. Um, and given the proportion of individuals that will die from this infection, that's why prevention has been so critical. So Dr. Conley talked a lot about the, the sort of the more downstream side of this, where we're talking about treatment um, or getting people supportive care and ventilators and ICU beds. Um, when we talk about public health interventions, we're thinking what's called upstream. Um, so everything upstream ends up flowing downstream. So someone who gets infected eventually will progress through this pathway and potentially end up at the treatment, uh, needing treatment or uh, ventilation. But obviously we want to prevent people from getting there in the first place, so we're not trying to play catch up. So when you're talking about these lower downstream infections, the overall goal is, you know, in the case of treatment to prevent serious illness. Um, in the case of a ventilator and ICU bed, it's, it's literally they're sick, they're very sick, but we want to keep them from dying. Then moving upstream from that, you're looking at things like masks and gloves and hand washing and like good respiratory etiquette, like covering your cough. And those interventions stop people from getting sick when they're exposed. And then the most upstream um, is that disease detective work, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, vaccination that stops people from, um, you know, sp it being spread in the community. Uh, and then isolation and quarantine and social distancing, which, hey, we're all on Zoom, we know what that means. <laughs> And so why this is critical is because there's two ultimate strategies to coping with COVID-19. The first is containment of the virus, and that's preventing the spread, which means fewer people sick with COVID-19. And then intertwined with that is mitigation. And that's where people talk about like flattening the curve is slowing the spread, meaning fewer people sick at one time, um, which means that the health system capacity can continue to like the health system has capacity to respond. Why that's so important is not just because it benefits the people who actually have COVID-19, but it also means that the healthcare system can continue to respond safely to the routine things. So people who have heart attacks can still go in and get emergency care and still get a stent placed in their heart so that they can survive that heart attack. Um, someone who has had a car accident, you know, can rapidly get transported um, and receive, you know, blood transfusions. And it also means that of those people um, who are sick with COVID, you know, they actually have access to an ICU. And that's, that's kind of what Dr. Conley was referring to, is that we have enough capacity to treat everyone who is there. The other piece around containment and mitigation is that, yes, although we do know that it does disproportionately affect people who are older. Um, if we look at the rate that Alberta is seeing right now um, in terms of fatal outcomes for our young healthy people, um, if 100,000 young healthy people get sick with COVID, that still means that 200 young healthy people will die. So in terms of the disease detective work, this has a couple pieces to it. So the case investigation is where we have been notified that there's a confirmed case and we end up talking to them. There's two main goals to that. The first is to figure out where they got infected um, and see if there's a, a cluster of cases that we haven't previously identified so we can intervene. And that allows us to find new cases. There's also contacting people who have been exposed to the virus. And that second part is the contact tracing. So the goal of contact tracing is to follow up with those people who've been exposed and may be symptomatic. If they are symptomatic, we, we can get them tested, we can treat them if necessary, and then we can isolate them for as long as they're infectious. For people who haven't developed any symptoms, um, we make sure that they're quarantined while they're at higher risk of developing COVID-19, and that's that 14-day period. And then for everybody else, uh, you know, they're advised to monitor for symptoms so that they know um, if they do develop them, if that's the likely cause. 
This is absolutely critical because this helps us identify the people who are most likely to be the next cases. It isolates them before they have symptoms. And so that's where we actually can use this to identify that asymptomatic spread piece. It also allows us to identify people who need help, um, particularly isolated seniors. They may not have had anyone check in on them recently. If we know they're positive, we can reach out and connect them with the care that they need. And lastly, this also protects our healthcare workers because then we know who is highest risk and we can make sure that everybody is using appropriate precautions along the way. The other public health intervention um, that I want to very briefly touch on is the idea of vaccination. Um, we don't have a vaccine at this time, although there's many in development. Um, vaccination is a critical part of preventing the spread, um, not just for individual protection, but because it would mean that the spread does not continue from person to person. Um, it generates natural protection against the virus. And the best part of this is that, you know, if we have a two to 10% overall risk of death in the population, um, we're avoiding that through a vaccine. And it also prevents the spread to higher risk people. Um, so this is where you go, well, I'm most likely to be fine if I get it, but other people may not be. And um, so, Another interesting note is that, you know, there were uh, vaccines that were working on uh, in development uh, post SARS to identify uh, potential vaccine targets, um, and that they had their funding cut. So if, if you know, scientific advancement and funding had continued for these trials, um, we might not be 18 months away from a potential vaccine. We might be a lot closer, a lot faster. So then there's this last piece um, that really is the part that's affecting us all very deeply and personally at this moment, and that's isolation, quarantine, and social distancing. So isolation is preventing the spread from people who are actively sick with COVID-19 or in the context here of people who have any sort of symptoms consistent with COVID-19. Um, I personally have been in and out of self-isolation because I have seasonal allergies. Um, people who have been potentially exposed to, uh, to COVID-19 um, are then placed in quarantine, so people who are asymptomatic but high risk of developing it. And then there's the rest of us who are social distancing um, right now, preventing potential spread that way. And why we need to do this with that legal power is because asking people to do things, um, you know, relies on not only their goodwill, because I think everyone wants to stop the spread, um, but it also prevents a lot of these issues around being, not having control of your circumstances where you can spread it. Um, and so that would be like pressuring individuals to return to work sooner than, you know, is actually safe for them to do so. If they're financially insecure, it's really important that we can be able to say, okay, look, um, you know, you cannot go back to work because it's dangerous for everybody. Your, your employer can't force you to go back into work. We're not allowing that to happen. Um, and let's find other ways to support you. And it takes the responsibility off that individual to say, I will suffer on behalf of others. And why doing so aggressively um, is so critical is that, you know, this is data uh, that was assessed from the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. Of, they found that places that had early activation of these social distancing measures and kept them longer, not only did they have um, a longer period of time that allowed the health system to cope, um, they also found that they had overall fewer cases. And so this is kind of one of the great examples of Philadelphia, where they had this big parade shortly after, um, you know, the virus was introduced and everybody was super close together, had a huge spike in cases and a heck of a lot of people ended up dying, um, versus St. Louis, where everything was very rapidly closed and they had this sort of longer period um, but where they were able to stop um, the spread. So when do we get back to normal, I think is probably the biggest question. Um, and so there are six criteria that we need to meet before we're ready to quote unquote, get back to normal. Uh, the first is that our community transmission needs to be under control. And that means that all of the new cases that are happening, we need to identify them um, as contacts before they come sick so that they're already isolated and we know transmission is ramping down in the community. Um, we need to have a healthcare system that can manage the detection of new cases, the testing, the isolation, and the contact tracing in a timely way so that we can have that community transmission under control. Um, we need to reduce the risks to our high vulnerability settings. And so that's, for example, the long-term care facilities, hospitals, group living settings, shelters. We need to have something in place to protect them. 
the workplaces that we go back to need to have these preventive measures still in place. So that means that we're still going to have to do the social distancing. It just won't be on a society-wide scale. It will be within um, the places that people are returning to. We need to be able to be sure that it's not going to get re-imported like we are starting to see in China. And we need to make sure that everybody is involved, that we are all still dedicated to stopping the spread of COVID-19. Um, that's really the core piece here is we all need to be able to continue with what we're doing just from, you know, two, two meters away from each other. So with that, I'm going to stop and we can move on. Actually, I'll bring this up of where to get reliable information and we can go to questions. Thanks very much, uh, Drs. Uh, Conley and Schindler. Those were excellent presentations. So uh, we will now uh, move to questions. And uh, I have a few questions that have started to come in from our audience. And I would uh, ask our audience to just add any questions to the question and answer chat box or send them in through uh, Facebook because we're also monitoring that. So the first question I have, uh, maybe Dr. Schindler might want to take this, is um, you described that the uh, US uh, situation is worse than ours. It's a worst case scenario right now. And so one of our um, audience members is wondering what kind of challenges or problems does that pose for Canada, considering how intertwined our two countries are as we try to flatten our curves? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's where that restriction around imported cases is really going to be, um, you know, make it really challenging for us to lift our overall restrictions because we need to, you know, maintain our supply chains um, and we need to maintain those connections. Um, but simultaneously, we need to be able to identify anyone who's sick at the border before they come in um, or have them quarantined before, you know, before they can move around Canada. Um, so I, I think it's going to be a big challenge in the coming months, uh, figuring out how we integrate those two things. For sure. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Conley, did you want to add anything to that particular question or should I go on to the next question? The next question, thanks. Okay. Um, so uh, the next question, which uh, might be more for Dr. Conley, uh, is uh, from Brian Bedard. He was wondering if infection does not provide immunity, how will a vaccine? Uh, good question. Uh, the preliminary evidence does suggest that um, with the recovery of most individuals, it will likely mean that the antibodies that are generated are uh, neutralizing antibodies, which would confer immunity. Uh, part of that is based on uh, some studies that have been done in individuals where they've given uh, infusions of plasma from individuals who have recovered and that it has had a uh, beneficial effect on those individuals. And secondly, We've also seen uh, evidence that people become um, quite well. Uh, if you look at the um, nature paper that I had indicated, by day eight to 10, uh, people have recovered. Uh, they have a full state of health again. And uh, we do know from the basic science papers that are coming out, there's very little in the way of any mutation that's occurring in the virus. There is some, but it's not gonna be like HIV or hepatitis C where quasi species are continuously um, being produced, which uh, would uh, bring difficulties into uh, providing a, a vaccine. So that's been one of the tricky things with the human immunodeficiency virus. It produces a multiple quasi-species, and as a, quas you don't, uh, as a consequence, you don't have an epitope from which you can derive a vaccine. But from what we're seeing uh, to this point in time, uh, it does not appear to be uh, uh, you know, readily mutating and producing multiple quasi-species, which gives great hope for a vaccine. Over. Um, and so this is a, a bit of a follow-up question uh, for Dr. Conley. Uh, one of our attendees is wondering if you've had COVID uh, diagnosed with a positive um, NP swab and, and you haven't uh, gained immunity that you could be reinfected. Is that true? You know, I think, again, uh, similar to the previous uh, response, I think that would be unlikely. Um, there are people who have had uh, recovery from uh, COVID and uh, they're dealing, you know, back on the healthcare lines and dealing with these um, patient populations again. And we've not to date seen any recurrence of infection or reinfection events that are occurring. 
that would be contingent upon quasi species that uh, somehow slipped through. The science to date is not suggesting that is indeed the case. Okay, thank you. Um, it's a question for Dr. Schindler. Uh, Google and Apple are developing smartphone apps for contact tracing. Uh, and in the UK, they have some preliminary plans as well to use these apps. Uh, can you talk about any plans to employ them in Alberta? So that's definitely something that we have had a lot of discussion about. Um, one of the issues with the apps is that they don't replace good old fashioned clinical judgment. Um, and so, you know, you, we've had stories where, you know, someone's been on the other side of a window and waving at someone who's in quarantine um, and they're being identified as a close contact and, and asked to isolate by these apps, uh, whereas obviously that person was not in any way exposed. Um, so there, there definitely is the ability to use that sort of data to support our contact tracing, but ultimately it does need to be a real human uh, to identify when it is a contact and when it isn't. So I might just ask a little follow up question on that contact tracing. Could you just give us maybe a bit more of an update on how we're doing in Alberta as far as contact tracing? You know, I know that we've um, asked a lot of the medical students to help out with contact tracing. Where are we at currently? Are, are we keeping up with the, the demand for contact tracing? Yeah, yeah, we're doing, it's actually been phenomenal. We're doing an amazing job. Um, we have over 400 contact tracers, um, about 100 of them working at any given time. Um, and so given that we are having 150 to 200 cases a day at this point, we're able to keep up and uh, do that contact tracing within 24 hours. So um, yeah, we're, we're planning to continue to ramp up this work and uh, we're bringing on some really phenomenal um, nursing staff as well, um, more nursing staff into this work. That's, that's good. That's wonderful news. Uh, so we have another question and you two can decide who will answer this one. Uh, it's the, the anonymous um, attendee here has written gro uh, grocery stores and other essential services are doing a fantastic job of giving priority access to seniors and healthcare workers. Do you foresee something similar happening for high risk groups, for example, those with chronic respiratory diseases, including asthma? Rochelle, I'll uh, let you take the first crack at that. Yeah, um, so I, I think that as we're starting to lift restrictions, we'll probably have to take graded uh, approaches, something like this. I don't actually know what that's going to look like in the future, but I, I think that that is definitely an appropriate response. We need to protect our most vulnerable citizens. So, yeah, And I'll just add, uh, there's a lot of uh, work going on now because I know our public health officials uh, have uh, suggested that the use of cloth masks maybe of some benefit um, in the general community as part of that graded response. There's a lot of work going on in, um, uh, uh, you know, this, the textile science and engineering uh, to be able to look at the quality of the cloth masks. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are many different types of uh, fabrics from natural products such as cotton wool, uh, all the way up to uh, some of the um, products that are like polypropylene, which are inside of medical surgical masks. And there is work going on now within the demand study with the World Health Organization, of which uh, we're participating here at the University of Calgary, that is looking at the actual engineering and design of facial masks that would have a much greater uh, capacity uh, and filtration uh, abilities, uh, as opposed to just a simple cotton mask, because it's a very generic um, recommendation now that the science would move forward very rapidly, I suspect. And so it would be part of a graded response with some science behind it, as opposed to the very generic wear a cloth mask, because uh, it may be of some assistance. So I think there will be some uh, evidence that will help us to help with that graded response that Rochelle had spoken about. And I agree, it's going to have to be a, a graded response, but there are maneuvers within that graded response that will have more science and evidence behind it as we move forward. Sure. Um, and so, uh, Dr. Conley, I think this next question I could quickly ask you, um, what is our testing capacity per day right now in Alberta? I know that we're talking about ramping it up, but do you know what it is at currently? Uh, the maximum that I think they've done on any one day was about uh, 3,300. Uh, and I know that uh, in some jurisdictions, uh, such as in South Korea, they were able to do 10 to 20,000 tests per day. Uh, per capita, Alberta does very well they rank anywhere from number four to number one uh, per 100,000 population in the world. They certainly rank number one in Canada in terms of uh, testing capacity. 
which uh, goes back to Rochelle's points about uh, contact tracing, which is a very important component. Uh, the, uh, it's my understanding, regional laboratories, similar to what has uh, occurred in Quebec and now uh, Ontario, uh, once they um, uh, move in that direction. But uh, I know that there are uh, some of the regional laboratories in, in Alberta are primed to add to that capacity as well. If we can move to five to 6,000 tests per day, uh, that's going to be quite remarkable. Um, we'll certainly vault us to number one in the world in testing capacity per 100,000 population. Thank you very much. Um, so this is a question that, uh, again, either of you can decide who wants to respond. Um, you have outlined the importance of flattening the curve and the risk of relaxing the current restrictions, but what about the risk of death to patients who are not uh, no longer able to get their screening for breast and colon cancer, the societal risk of increased child and spousal abuse, increased alcohol and drug abuse that is occurring? Are those issues being considered? Rochelle, that's a little bit of a public health question, so I might defer that one to you. Yeah, so this is, that is actually a fantastic question because those are really some of the core issues that we've been discussing. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's not just, you know, we, we tell everyone to stay home and we kind of leave it there. Um, we've definitely been working really hard to make sure that there are supports in the background for those folks, um, you know, who might be at risk of abuse, um, that we are giving extra supports in this time, um, that we are, you know, for the screening, um, realistic that can wait for a couple of months, but obviously that is critical and does need to continue um, sort of within the next year. So I, this is, these are exactly the sort of complexities that public health deals with. Yes, I strongly agree that we are considering those and that we are actively trying to action on them. Yeah, and I'll just yeah. say, it's not just unintended consequences in the public health sphere. Uh, we've had a woman who came in um, to the emergency room who for all intents and purposes, the elderly woman self-isolating, groceries being dropped off, following all the rules, but uh, you know, it had pulmonary infiltrates, but it was heart failure and, a, and an MI. Their MI and heart failure treatment was disadvantaged because the uh, emergency room physicians became all consumed that it was COVID, uh, you know, and not taking a proper uh, history. And so was the management of this uh, MI with heart failure optimized uh, because they were consumed with thinking that it was all due to issues pertaining to the COVID. So that's another issue related to unintended consequences of delays in diagnosis and management of other conditions. And then the mental health challenges, there's already uh, work um, on the Twitter feeds that the uh, recent um, mass shooting in Nova Scotia, his business had uh, uh, tanked from the, the, the denturist. And so, uh, this, you know, provide an incentive to do the, uh, the rampant shooting, uh, business was collapsing, was this a COVID related consequence? I think it's premature and again I would uh, uh, advise you not to follow the Twitter feeds on that because there may be much more to the backstory on this, but uh, obviously mental health issues become a concern as well. Um, so we've got just a couple more minutes, um, so I'll take a couple more questions. Um, is the surge to the medical system still expected and when do you expect this to happen? And what are your thoughts on when we can start to resume elective surgeries and procedures? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll tackle that one. Um, I think uh, to go back to Rochelle's slide uh, where she showed the, 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 the six items that were outlined by the World Health Organization, many governments provincially, nationally uh, are looking at uh, what must be done, thank you. Uh, in terms of the criteria. It'll be a, a graded response, I think, to quote what uh, Rochelle had mentioned. And um, people will begin to gradually uh, look at uh, reorganizing their lives and uh, uh, moving forward with, with elective surgeries and other things. But I think the important thing is, do we have the capacity to uh, avoid that surge? And I think if you look at the curve, the way it's flattening in Alberta, and if you look at the projections that have been delivered by our premier, we're well below those projections, uh, you know, at this point in time. So hopefully it means we, we've done a good job and that we've got the ability to contact trace, to rapidly identify and have testing capacity to be able to um, move forward if there are any blips on the radar as we begin to introduce uh, a lifting of restrictions uh, and moving forward. And also we're gonna see rapid testing capacity that will be uh, developed in serologic testing 
um, so that we can move forward with that as well. Uh, plus, there's a lot of work being done on a vaccine. So if it's accelerated enough uh, and we'll be able to move forward, could we see a vaccine by the end of this year that would also be a part of that solution? So all of those uh, factors will come into play, but it's going to have to be a delicate balance as we move forward with the ability to be able to pull back in should that uh, need arise. Uh, that's uh, excellent. That was a, a, a nice way to end. Um, I think we'll cl close off our um, digital forum for today. So I just want to thank our two speakers for their excellent presentations and also thank all of our attendees who joined and thank, uh, particularly thanking those who asked any questions. If you have any other questions that uh, were not answered today, please do send them in to us and we would be happy to forward those on to our speakers. So uh, thanks everyone for joining and we will be holding more of these uh, digital forum sessions in the future and we will let you know about those and hope that you will join us at that time. Thanks very much everyone. Thank you for hosting.